Stay tuned to the Ask Dr. Ross podcast. It's created to give you info to succeed at college. Our hosts are highly qualified. Dr. Catherine Ross is a member of the University of Texas System's Academy of Distinguished Teachers. She's also a popular professor of 19th century English literature. Co-host and multimedia editor Nathan Witt provides a student perspective. Ask Dr. Ross is a community service of the University of Texas at Tyler. Hi, I'm Catherine Ross, and this is a podcast for parents, students in school who are thinking about going to college, college students who are already here, adults who are thinking of maybe going back to college, and really anyone who wants to know more about what life in colleges and universities is like today in the U.S. of A. I'm here with my friend Nathan Witt, who's a student here. If you'd like to ask Dr. Ross a question, you can email us at adrquestions at gmail.com. No question is too big, too small. There's no right or wrong questions. We're here for it all. Today is a special episode. We've got two guests with us, and we're going to talk about the best advice for how to succeed in college, how to enjoy your college years, and how to get the best return on your investment. Dr. Ross, would you like to introduce who's in the room with us? All right. I'll introduce Dr. Colin Snyder, who is a friend and colleague. He's Associate Professor of History a fellow of the UT Tyler Academy of Distinguished Teachers. He's won quite a few awards for his teaching. He's past president of the UT Tyler Faculty Senate, and he's the stepfather of a daughter who got her B.A. at UT Tyler and who is headed off this fall to do graduate work in archaeology and anthropology. So he knows a little bit about how to be a college student, a college dad. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll introduce the student in the room. Uh, Noah, too, is a friend of mine, also my boss, at the Patriot Talent. He's an award-winning communication and journalism student. He's the editor-in-chief of the Patriot Talent, which is UT Tyler's student media organization, and he's now headed to graduate school here at UT Tyler. He'll be graduating this semester with a BA in mass communication, and he did it all, Dr. Ross, while being a student worker here on campus. Oh my goodness, and having to be your boss, that was really tough. That was the hard part. It is absolutely the hardest part of my job. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. So what are you going to get your master's in? Communication. Of course. Well, as Nathan said, we asked you all to prepare by coming to tell us what your best advice is for students about what to do and what not to do to be a good student, to be a successful student, to enjoy college, to not waste any time or money. And I guess we'll start with you. Okay, yeah. So my first one is that all students should explore their college campus, but not only their campus, but also explore their town that their campus is located in. Ah. Oh, yeah. Dr. Snyder, you want to comment on that? You've been to several campuses, including this one. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea, in part because, if nothing else, it takes off some of the panic of the first day of class where you're trying to find your classroom at the last minute, and you've got somebody saying, where's this room inside of your office? And you say, oh, it's three buildings away. You better hurry up. Or sometimes even, I don't even know where that building is. Good luck. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, in part because it allows you to make the most of your experiences there. And I guess that kind of conveniently leads into one of mine. It wasn't my first, but just the sense of finding what you want throughout the entire college career, figuring out what it is that you're interested in, the things available to you, the opportunities. And I think whether it's social clubs, just goings on campus, activities in and outside of the campus community, I think the sort of exploring the town and campus is a great way of going about and facilitating that and taking full advantage of the opportunities provided to you at college, which a lot of students I don't think are aware of without that kind of exploration. In fact, one of our subsequent episodes is going to be all the things you didn't know you pay for when you pay for your tuition in college. But the key word, I think, of what you just used, both of you, is the idea of being interested in the space where you live and in the things you might learn and also learning how to get interested and explore this new place. I love it when I see students in August before classes have started, new freshmen walking around looking for their classes. But also noticing that there's this beautiful pond, noticing that there are walking trails, noticing that there's an athletic center over there that has a lot of cool stuff, including a swimming pool. True. So I love that as one of your best bits of advice. I wanted to get your opinion. There's kind of two schools of thought with your first point, which would be either to try to get up there early, like you said, in the spring or before the semester starts and look around there, or there's feeling it out as you go and maybe every weekend trying to go explore something new 
which one would you suggest? So actually, whenever I first came to UT Tyler, my stepmom actually graduated here with a degree in teaching. Whenever I was coming here to UT Tyler, she told me that like she didn't want me to be walking around, like looking around for everything, just confused. Yeah. So what we did is the weekend before the school started, we came up here and I got the chance to explore every little bit of this campus, walk around, ask people questions. And whenever we first started on that first day, there was not that uncertainty of, oh my gosh, where is my first class? I'm about to be 10 minutes late. No, it, it was so much easier doing it that way and going up there and just really getting to know what was around the campus. A theme of one of our earlier podcasts is that there's a lot you can find out about the campus before you're ever enrolled, including talking to advisors ahead of time, talking to the one-stop shop financial aid side ahead of time. A lot of people don't realize that all of those are resources available to students. and getting to know the layout, the places, but also who some of the people in some of those offices are. Dr. Snyder knows about how important all that stuff is, right? Oh, yeah, and especially because some of the buildings are rather labyrinthine or oh, yeah. quixotically numbered where you have students at one end of the building, where's this room? You know, it's way at the other end. But the numbers, I know, I know the numbers, but <laughs> way at the other end of the building. Fair. So you got another piece of advice for an incoming student? Oh, absolutely. A big piece of advice would be to befriend those around you and actually get to know students or teachers as well that you're in classes with or just going to student events that we were talking about like earlier. Just making friends on campus can be so helpful and help alleviate some of the stresses that come with being a college student. What's your number one tip for a student who might have a hard time approaching people to make friends? Absolutely. So whenever I first came here, I was actually really shy. Yeah. And I Not got, anymore. Oh, no, not anymore at all. <laughs> I got involved with our student media because that's what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a journalist, a videographer. So I found the passions that I had and found an outlet here at the university for it. And just getting into that, meeting people, that kind of brought me out of my shell. And through that, I made friends in the program and that I still talk with today, even though they've graduated. It's really fulfilling. I always say that education is a matter of relationships. What is your take on what Noah just said, Dr. Snyder? Yeah, I think that's essential for the functions of sort of a support network. That The college is the first time a lot of students are out on their own. Even if they're still living at home, the schedules can be so different from what mom and dad are on that you have to find your own way through this. But to do that by yourself is completely alienating and isolating. And that can just, I think, intensify the stress and the worry that brings upon. So I think finding those colleagues, even if it's just gathering, posing a study group or just chatting even after class about the class or the professors or what classes to take in the future, those can be little steps that even for those who are more introverted, you don't have to do a lot in terms of initiating those conversations that can still help you really build up these ties that can often then last because you'll see these students in other classes. So I think, yeah, that kind of support network, and it doesn't just have to be classmates. It can be, as you said, with your major. So if your department has functions, get to know colleagues in your department. Certainly the social life of student events that the Office of Student Affairs hosts, or even, I believe, we have a fairly active Greek life of sorts. So just finding any, there are any number of avenues. I don't think there's really an excuse for anyone to not find a path, even if it's not the one that everyone else chooses. There's two things that, Colin, you just said that really interested me. First of all, actually, something you said, Noah, about you might make friends even with teachers, which is that actually our faculty really care very much for us to be in good talking, communicating relationships. I usually try to require my students to show up and visit my office the first two weeks of class and just come by themselves or in small groups to get to know me. And the more they get to know their teachers, and a lot of times first-year students are really afraid of faculty. They've been trained that faculty members are terrifying, scary oh, yeah. people and, and all that. And so I think that's an important thing. Everyone should be encouraged to get to know their teachers. The teachers want to be known and want to get to know you. But the other thing you said, Colin, was about how you could use study groups. Boy, oh boy, are study groups useful. Have you used them? I have. And in law schools and medical schools, that's a, almost a very common thing now is that the students – Almost, it's not required, but you get collected with a bunch of people. And my students that do that on their own are really repaid, not only in friendships, but they just do better in school. Absolutely. Whenever I went to my first psychology class, I'm not good at psychology. I was doing really poorly in the class, but I found friends, or not friends, just people around me and talked to them. And actually, I got involved in a study group, and my grade shot up significantly in that class. You learn as much from your classmates as you do, I think, sometimes from the class. As you share what 
they heard something different from you or they heard it in a way that you didn't hear it, things like that. If I can add, too, I think the other benefit of that is simply that we'd be fooling ourselves as faculty if we thought that sometimes students don't just like the gossip. So sometimes those student <laughs> study groups aren't even really about the studying. It's more about the sort of fetching about the class or other assignments or just gossiping about who did what in class. But I think that's a really valuable outlet for letting students blow off some of that steam and reducing some of the pressures that build up in the course of the academic. So even study groups sometimes are only nominally study groups, right? But they can be just as valuable for their social function as they are for their actual academic utility. Very honest. I absolutely <laughs> agree with that. That is very honest. <laughs> yep. They don't always love us, but no, it's they try to the like students. us. Yeah. We don't always love you either. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I've created some rough things before you. <laughs> yes. So Colin, let's get you to lead off with one of the single most important things you want to tell students. Sure. So this may seem counterintuitive to what was just said, but I would also suggest being self-sufficient with limits, of course. That I think one of the biggest shocks students encounter is just how much you're on your own in some regards. That you certainly can have those the study groups or quote unquote study groups. <laughs> And these different social organizations are just small social circles you run in. But at the end of the day, it's your degree and your education. And so you have to be on top of things yourself and really applying yourself in ways that I think high schoolers aren't accustomed to that. And Lord knows, and I'm sure you can test this to Dr. Ross, the degree to which students like, where's this? When's this to? It's all, you have the information, do it yourself, by figure your it chance. out. I don't remember my due dates because that's why it's in the syllabus. So I don't have to clutter my brain with that. So a lot of that, but also just even beyond being alert of what the syllabus says, things like getting ahead on the assignments if you can, or keeping up to date with what's due, accepting responsibility when you fall short. So I've had students who, can I have an extra 12 hours for the paper? Sure. I don't, I'm not that dogmatic on due dates if it's in that day, because if you've got other stuff going on, it's fine. But if you don't communicate to me, then I'm going to just assume it's late. You have to be your own advocate in many ways. And so I think learning that kind of self-sufficiency, acknowledging too that when something goes wrong, it might be your fault and not so you can blame your professors all you want. Like, oh, I can't believe they didn't let me turn this in late. You knew when it was due and you chose to put it off to the last minute. This is not their fault for your failure to get it done on time. So learning where your own responsibilities rest as well, I think is a hard lesson that we all have gone through at some point in college, but it's an important one as a part of that self-sufficiency as well, that you're responsible for your education, your successes and your shortcomings as long as you can build on those. Yeah. I love that. I've talked about Chickering and Riser's seven vectors of student development in another podcast. And the notion of taking responsibility for your own lives is really important. And a lot of times youngsters don't realize how many of the skills, how many of the tools we've given them to do that, like the syllabus, like the Canvas pages. For those of you who don't know what Canvas is, it's a learning management system that most colleges now use. You have a web page and places where all your assignments are. Yeah. And so in some ways, don't you think, Dr. Snyder, that all the reminders that Canvas does should set you up so you couldn't possibly forget anything? Should, yeah. But I think <laughs> the pressures can also build where it just, there's a strong tendency, and I can speak to this from personal experience of people I've known where the response is, if there's a problem that begins, just ignore it, maybe it'll go away. And it never goes away. It just gets worse with time. But there's that ever optimistic hope that if I just ignore it, it will fix itself. And that's just not how the world works. Sometimes it's just the deer in the headlights reaction, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. No, how did you respond when you first got here to this challenge to be responsible for your own education? So I'm going to be honest. I was a terrible high school student. I didn't turn in my work. I waited till last second. My parents would call it like a Hail Mary at the end. I'd have to get a certain grade on my final. And whenever I came to college, I moved down here and I had to be responsible for myself. But the apps and stuff that we have here, like Canvas, being able to see and be able to organize my schedule around my due dates, that has been super helpful in me yeah. getting to turn to my assignments to be on time. And it's taught me to be better with my time management as well because I see everything in a calendar with what's due. And the syllabuses that are offered to us, like paying attention to that can really help you within the semester. And just so you'll know too, faculty try to plan a semester so things are spread out. Dr. Snyder, what else can you tell us about how to be a successful student? I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I guess it leads into one of my don't elements, which is don't stop communicating. Yes. Back to that deer in the headlights incident I just mentioned. 
The response isn't to shut down and stop communicating. It's to communicate as quickly as possible, often through email. That is, as Dr. Ross mentioned, I was Senate president for a few years ago, and I learned the value of creating a paper trail because sometimes things can <laughs> slip through the tracks. So if you send an email to a professor and they don't respond, you can say, I sent it to you. Look, here it is. They're more willing, oh, I dropped the ball, not the student. So I think just constantly communicating, not just with your professors, that's certainly the case, that it's okay to admit you don't understand what's going on. A lot of us will ask our students, does that make sense? And I tell my students, that's not a request for you to all nod and agreement at my brilliance. It's a sincere question because if it's not making sense, it's not that you're too dumb to figure it out. It's that I haven't communicated it clearly and that's my job so that you can let me know that it wasn't communicated clearly. Can you try again? Because the answer is yes. So I think that notion of communication, it's a two-way street, but if you stop it on your end, the professors will too. That if you get a C on an exam and you don't email me because you're worried about it, I'm not losing sleep over it. Maybe you're fine with a C. I don't know what your scholarship status is or anything like that. You don't want to over-communicate and just bombard your professor with an email every two hours because they hate that too. But you want to constantly be in communication, and especially when things start to get rough, because if you have that legacy of working hard and being communicative and things start to go awry in life because life does happen, they're more likely to be far more forgiving and flexible knowing like this student is a good student, has done really good things, and they've always been in touch, and all of a sudden this has come up so I can work with them to help them navigate what they're dealing with in their real own life or give them time to navigate their own life while balancing their coursework. Dr. Snyder, do you ever have students where the whole semester has passed by and you know practically nothing about them? Oh, yeah. Sometimes they disappear in week two, and I have no idea why. Yeah, and I wanted to bring that up because I always wonder why are they in college if they're not trying to make their presence known? I always say to my students the first couple of days, because I require students to speak up every week. If you sit back and never say a word, you're basically teaching everybody you don't matter and you have nothing to contribute. Ignore me. I'm not important. And to me, this is the time when you're the most important. And there's only four years of it, maybe five or six, depending on how many years you work. Or two with dual credit. But it's one of the few times when you get a chance to really get yourself out there and practice being you or the you you feel like this week versus the you you want to be next week. Being out there and not being afraid to ask a question, not being afraid to maybe look like a fool, but probably not, is one of my favorite things to remind people about. Noah, anything that you want to say that they, we really must never do when you're a student? Never, ever. Okay. I think, you, I want to echo what you just said. You said that students tend to overthink whenever they want to ask a question. And I've been there too. Whenever I'm sitting in a classroom, I'm like, man, is this really what it's supposed to be? And I hold back sometimes. But the more classes I've been through getting higher with and going to my fourth level classes, Everyone just says exactly what's on their mind, and it's excellent because it creates an amazing conversation between the professor, and it can also promote conversations within the students as well. Funnily enough, that ties into my third do, which was take the initiative. Absolutely. Right? In addition to being self-sufficient, don't be hesitant to speak up in class. Don't be afraid of what others think of you, within limits, of course. You don't want to be coming off saying just things that are so horrific that they'll remember it 20 years from now about that person <laughs> who said that one thing in class, but you, you're not there for them. And they're not there for you. You're, each of you is there for yourself in a fashion, right? That you can build that support network, as I said earlier. But at the end of the day, it's your education. And as Dr. Ross just said, if you're just sitting there quiet, showing, like, what are you showing other than you don't care? And what are you doing here then? And, and I admit, not everyone's ready for college right away. And some have to come back later and realize they had to do some growing up first. And that's a totally acceptable part of the path, the process in life. But that you should always be taking the initiative and advocating for yourself. And not just in the classroom. It could be taking the initiative. You Noah, you said that you found your media communications group. You got here, and this is the thing I'm interested in. I'll go work. That was the kind of initiative you should take of where can I find my spots? And it's okay if they aren't all winners, that you can try, oh, I'll go to this student group, and then this one's not for me. But that's okay. That doesn't mean no student group is for you. Just keep at it and see if there are other things that interest you. And I think that really then helps both your in-class experience and your out because the two aren't separable, that the in-class and the out-of-class experience are part of the entire college experience. And so that what you learn in those out-of-classroom settings can often be brought into the classroom and vice versa. I remember being told once when I was a young professor, they're far more likely to remember how you treated them than what you taught them. Don't forget to treat yourself and to relax. Because oftentimes we can get bogged down with tests, assignments, things going on in our lives. Always remember to take time for yourself with whatever it is, whether it's you're going to sit down for an hour and just watch your favorite TV show, whether it's, oh my gosh, I did so well on this test. I should go out and get an awesome steak for dinner or something like that. 
treating yourself and rewarding yourself is a great way to relieve some of that stress that just comes with being a college student. Yeah. If I can, I just heard it from our outgoing SGA president. Landry Smith. Smith. Yeah. Just heard this from Landry. He spoke to one of my communications classes and he shared with us a parable, which I'm a huge fan of parables. I'll uh, summarize it like this. There's two lumberjacks working in competition with each other. The first one says to himself, I'm not going to stop until the work is done. The second uh, lumberjack comes out and he chops a couple trees and then he goes back to the barn and he sharpens his axe. And then he comes back out and as he passes by the first lumberjack who's chopped down two trees in the time it took him to go sharpen his axe, he said, hey, you should should really go sharpen your axe. It's probably about time. And he said, I'm just going to go till the work is done. Second lumberjack goes back, chops a couple more trees down, goes back to the barn and sharpens it. And once again, he says, as he passes by the first lumberjack, he says, hey, you should really sharpen your axe. And he says, it would waste too much time. I'm trying to be done first. The cycle continues until the end of the day. And the second lumberjack is done hours before the first. He comes in after the sun has gone down. He's sweating. His entire body is sore. And he sets his axe down and he said, I, I don't understand. I never stopped. How come you finish so much faster? And the second lumberjack says, you should have kept your axe sharpened. What a perfect metaphor of sometimes just constantly staying on top of the work isn't the best way. Sometimes you have to give yourself a little space, like you said, to de-stress, reward yourself for the small victories, that kind of stuff. And also, and some I'm fanatical about is getting sleep. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. eating right. Absolutely. And if sharpening his axe is also going home and getting some rest, some dream time, uh, or as you say, watch your favorite TV show for a while, you really need that. It gives you a chance to think freshly as well. So many students right now are pulling all-nighters because it's the time of exams and papers. Oh, yeah. And I'm seeing big brown circles coming up around some students' faces and some kids about ready to cry. Your resilience is just about depleted. But we probably ought to do a whole episode on how to avoid procrastination. Procrastination. That'd be a great episode. I need to know how to do it, too, is part of the deal. (laughs) Yeah, I was about to say, that'd be a good episode for me. But, yeah, I think it's all of us. Yeah. This time of year, there's so many things we're trying to pull together. We're recording this at the end of a semester of a whole academic year. We're just going, how much longer? Here we go. Worst Um, time of the year. It is. It is. And we'll all collapse in about three weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Although you and I don't get to collapse, we're working all summer we're on this. We're the summer. We're going to be getting more stuff done. It's okay. The load gets a lot easier, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. But no, to your point, too, real quick, because one of the best pieces of advice I got in graduate school, and I realized only belatedly, I also did this in undergrad, but a friend told me, find a time of the week that's yours, full stop. And it has to be the same time every week where you don't kick yourself and over not getting things done that you could be doing. Just and So I always claimed Friday af- at noon until I woke up Saturday morning is mine. And I gave that advice to another friend who started grad school later. They chose Tuesday morning. Wake up, cup of coffee, don't worry about it, have lunch, then get back to work. And the degree of mental health that's saved is enormous. I think that can even be extended to undergrad. I realized belatedly, oh yeah, Friday nights we always played video games. Didn't worry about homework for Friday night until we woke up Saturday morning. No, I completely agree with that. Finding time that's just yours, it can save you so much stress. Because with the parable, it's very valid. Students work themselves to death, and some wait till last second, like you're talking about with procrastination. If you give time to yourself to relax, play games, watch TV, do whatever, you're much more sharp. Like, you're just going to be more creative. You're going to be more productive. Your studying will actually get done. One thing that I've learned in my college career is cramming just does not work. You're overloading your brain so much. Yeah. Like, spacing that time out, it just can help so much. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. The research shows that the single best way to learn is reiterating, recalling, repeating, reviewing, taking time so that it finally sinks in, sharpening those neural pathways, traveling them over and over again. And this is one of those things that high school kids do at the end of their senior year a lot. They blitz through, they finish with school, and that's kind of the last thing a lot of them remember. And if they passed and graduated, they're probably thinking, I can do that in college. No. No. There's... You shouldn't want to because you're paying a lot of money for this. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like you're if you're doing it with that style where you're cramming last second, then you're just taking memory tests. You're not learning anything. You're just memorizing it for a little bit of time, and then it's gone in a week. And you paid for that information. Like you should be 
selfish for that information. You should want it. Another, just to your point of taking that time, I stole this quote from Instagram, but I saw a post that said, if you make yourself feel guilty for taking a break, it's not a break. You know, Ooh. and if so, the whole time you're sitting there, oh man, I need to be doing this in the back of your head while you're relaxing. If you're like, I should be, oh, I've got to get back to this. Oh my gosh, I only have an hour left. Then you're not relaxing. You're still stressing yourself out. Kind of a light bulb thing for me. So where are we on our list? So my sort of ties a little bit into all of this in that don't be too hard on yourself for setbacks, but instead to really focus on what you're learning at all times, not just in the classroom, though certainly there, but also just in terms of personal growth, that I think because of the very nature and structure of a university education, we think in semester blocks, but the learning happens, like maybe the content is a 15-week block, but the skills you're developing and that are going to be extending beyond, and some faculty may call upon you to bring that skill back in later, right? Whether it's writing or giving talks before a room. But not just that. Like, maybe you don't get the test grade you thought, but that doesn't mean you're an idiot or it's the end of the world. It comes back to what I said earlier about the dues of the initiative and the self-sufficiency is figure out, okay, did I do everything I could have? Is this just a thing that doesn't click with me? Or did I, should I go talk to the professor in office hours and maybe talk it through with them and figure out what's going on and see if I can't learn it? Whether that means, oh, I should have asked that question in the class when, I did, when they asked if I had any questions. And I thought, oh, I don't have any questions, but I did. I should have done that. And just do that dual level of thinking of, okay, what are you learning content-wise that's helping you get towards your personal and professional goals, but also what are you learning, as to Dr. Ross's point, about being an adult? Where is this sort of a, the cliched, quote-unquote, life lessons that you can pick up along the way that are cliche, but they're real? Yeah. Like, oh, man, I procrastinated so many times, I finally learned i got to quit doing that because it just it never pays off. I always think it'll work out well. It never does. So to your point about giving yourself a break and some grace, I think that applies to even in the learning moments of there are going to be peaks and valleys, but that doesn't mean the end of the world. Just think about the growth you're going through and ways to improve. And the other thing, too, about those valleys or that failed test or whatever is that's the most important moment where you can learn. If you go back and revisit the test that you failed or the questions you didn't answer right or the problems that you ran into, I usually try to go over a test or get students to write something about a test that they just took to f- investigate what did I not study so that I missed that question. You learn more from failing than you do from being perfect because then you have to rethink it. And then once you rethink yeah. it, you've gone through it again. And again, like you said, Dr. Snyder, there are going to be so many opportunities to improve that one or two mistakes are not going to be the end of the world. Students who worry, oh, my grade point average is going to be ruined by one bad grade. I want to say, no! Yeah, I won't remember that exam before them. I, I, don't you remember what I got on that exam? I sure don't. Yeah. But you're doing fine now. Yeah. If I don't, why do you? And also, the trajectory of if you start poorly and do well at the end, that's where you want to be. Yeah. What about you? How do you respond to what he's been saying? As a lab tech and the mass comm department, I have students come in all the time saying, oh my gosh, I just did so bad on this package. I did terrible on that test. There's no hope for me at this point. And every single time, they do fine at the end of the semester. And they're stressing themselves out over nothing. Like y'all are saying, one bad test isn't going to change it. Like, you can still graduate and do fine. Maybe getting a B in a class, it's not the end of the world. B is still good. I I totally get the mindset of, oh my god, I got a B, I failed. No, NF would be a fail. A is excellent. B is good. C is average. That's fine. That's a degree. D is poor. F is failing. B is not failing. So many students beat themselves up over their grades. I've known friends that... You know, whenever they get a, uh, God forbid, they get a C, right? It's not the end of the world. You'll be fine. You'll still do fine in the class. You'll do the, take the next class, and your professor won't probably even remember it. So I think students should just, they, they can learn from their failures. And, stuff. and comparing yourself to others is always a big mistake. Oh, yeah. my, my favorite quotation is, comparison is the thief of joy. Just be your own monitor, your own supporter, your own friend. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's impossible to, to really compare yourself because you don't know where they started from. You don't know what their advantages and disadvantages were. Um, I have a question for the two capital A adults in the room. There's a phrase that I, th- I think is getting really popular now, and that's growth is not linear. And I just wanted y'all's opinion, having experienced more of growth than Noah and I, do you feel like that's accurate or would you adjust that? sentence in any way? I guess there's still setbacks, but I think it's 
I don't know that it's not linear in the sense that you're it's a ongoing project, right? From birth to death. So that's very linear. Sure. I think ju- it, perhaps it isn't linear or it is linear. I don't know, but it's not consistent. It's not just sort of like the steady growth rate constantly. It's like any economic thing. Some years are better growth. Some years are worse growth, even re- you know, recession. So you could have periods where you just feel like you're treading water, but that's a fine place to be because that's what you need to do. Like you're where you need to be for that stage in life. And all of a sudden the next stage of life hits and all of a sudden it's right into the firestorm and all of a sudden it's an intense amount of growth in a very short concentration of time because it's all just hitting the fan all at once. So I think it may not be linear, but it's also not steady. That there are periods where you're going through a lot more and a lot more growth and periods where you settled into who you are and that who you are is appropriate to where you are in life. I understand entirely where you're coming from on that. I would say, though, that sometimes it's circular in the sense that you might have to circle back and do some things. I know in my life, I started one life, one career, and at 40, I changed my mind and I had to circle back and do some things. And I know that when I circled back, I was a much better graduate student, for example, PhD student, than I was a master's student. I went to BA, got a master's, and then eh, did some other stuff. When I went back for the PhD, then I really knew for sure why I was there, I think. And so I was better at it. I was also at a different sort of life cycle than most grad students. Most grad students are in their 30s, and I was 40 and had a life. And I think I was growing in a different way, Colin. But do you know what they meant by that? I think it means a lot, like Dr. Snyder was saying, about it is not consistent in if you were to chart it out, it's not a straight line. Yeah. 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 It has its ups and downs. But I also wanted to hand it to y'all to see when y'all hear it, how do y'all discern it? Because I think it's just a, a couple word sentence that people throw out there sometimes it's started to become one of those things that it's starting to get lost. In. I will add this. I know a couple of students of mine who, for example, had pretty difficult childhoods. Yeah. And there were some periods in their childhoods where they didn't get a lot of the things that a little bit more fortuitous childhood might have given them. And they had to go back and supply some of that stuff for themselves in their 20s. So a lot of us are living in a linear way, when you think about what the psychologists have told us about their different stages of growth and the different things that we're supposed to be able to do with each decade, sometimes you got to go back and pick up some things from the decade that you missed or the decade when you were sick or the decade when you were asleep. And I think too often, <laughs> Or your parents were asleep. <laughs> and I think building off of that too, I think not only is it not, whether it's linear or not, everyone, the growth schedules are different for every individual. Based yes. On the, that some people have lived very sheltered, privileged lives so that maybe you know, it's pretty smooth sailing up to 20 and then all of a sudden, welcome to the world. And right. like, Whereas maybe some people have gone through some pretty horrific things as kids, but they're more, I would say they're better equipped necessarily, but we all eventually get to those levels of dealing with, coping with things like loss or difficulty or professional struggles or what have you, but that the timeline for that can vary from individual to individual. And I don't, to, to your earlier don't, it's unfair to compare where you are on your own personal growth journey to others because your life is fundamentally different than everybody else's, as is everybody else's. Yeah. And you're never finished. Yeah. yeah. You're never finished. I'm still learning stuff when I'm old, older than you guys. Never, I'm never, the capital A, A, A adult in the room. Never finished till they engrave your gravestone, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. All right. I think we're on Noah's last don't. My last one was don't procrastinate, which we've talked about. A procrastination is just absolutely one of the killers in college. Yeah. I, wait till last second to do a eight page paper, you're not going to get it done. That is such a hard skill to learn, but you'll either learn it or you will not learn it. Yeah. Or you'll fail. Absolutely. You'll you'll learn it or it'll catch up to you. But through, like we were talking through those failures, you can learn. You can learn. You learn a lot more, I think. Absolutely. You learn, like we're saying, you learn more from your failures than your successes. I took all the failures that I did in high school and then I've changed those habits and stuff like that. And it has been really beneficial. There's never a point in which you can't turn it around. Like you're saying, you can circle back. Let's say that you start off doing engineering, right? You're like, oh my gosh, this is too much math for me. I just can't possibly do this. And then you switch to art and you find out that, oh my gosh, I haven't really explored the side of my brain. Then you find that you love it. Yeah. Whenever you're super comfortable and you, you fully know for yourself that, you know, this is my spot, that's when you should like, like really set into it. If you have like inhibitions or you're like, I just absolutely hate this, you can always switch to something different. And maybe college isn't for you. Maybe you wanted to go do a trade or something like that. That's always an option as well. I'm reminded of Winnie the Pooh here. (laughs) And when Tigger shows up and 
they don't know what Tiggers like to eat. And Pooh and Piglet take Tigger around and they try to see if he likes to eat honey, which is what Pooh Bear's like. Tiggers don't like honey. And they take him around to eat what Piglets eat and what Eeyore the horse eats. And they finally find something that Tigger likes and that he eats. And it's like, finally, he's found his niche, you know, what he likes. And to me, I've talked about the core before, but so many times kids come in and they don't know what they don't know. They think they don't like math or they think they don't like art or they don't like history or they don't like English poetry. And they go in instead of saying, hey, maybe I will like it if I give it a chance. You said the very first thing you said is go out and get to know the territory. Give the territory a chance to get to know you. Absolutely. Give the history professor over here or the English professor here or the communications or the math professor a chance to enchant you with their subject. Because most of us love our subjects. And uh, giving yourself a chance to grow in ways you didn't know you even could grow is one of the few things. There's a lot of things at college. No place else can you get that, I don't think, really. It's college where you get that smorgasbord of ideas. That perfectly leads into my last don't, which was don't just view college as a necessary step for a career. I think there's too much pressure from all kinds of angles, parents, high school counselors, university administrators, culture more generally of college's purpose is for you to go get a job. And that certainly is a part of it. You don't want to finish four years or five years or however many years of college and then be unemployable. But to focus on that just turns college into a means rather than an end unto itself. And I think the value of all of these different experiences, there is no place in life ever again like college, not before and not after, where yeah. even though you hate, I remember I just begrudgingly took the one math class I had to take and begrudgingly made my way through biology and was happy with a B. But regret in hindsight, I wish I'd paid more attention because it's not like I need that information on a daily basis now, but I was just joking with students a couple weeks ago. I was on Wikipedia, and I learned, wait, it's not, the colon's the large intestine. I thought they were separate things. And <laughs> just, sort of like, I, I kind of like, and just sort of entering into the Wikipedia wormhole of different fo- digestive tract fo- organ functions, the sort of thing. I wish I had taken anatomy when I was in college. You can learn stuff that you won't necessarily need, but the value is in the act of learning. Mm. And there's not going to be a chance again where you get to discover all these different elements of the world and these different things that may or may not interest you, but you don't know until you try it. I often rail against dual credit to sort of what Dr. Ross was saying of if you're going to hate a thing, hate it from the professionals, that if you're being taught biology or history or literature in high school, that person doesn't have a PhD. Like they don't spend and dedicate their life to understanding and doing that. So you can still go to high college and decide physics isn't for me, history isn't for me, but at least you learned it from the people who do it for a living. And I think yeah. that in some ways, college is a giant playground and they, as much for the mind as for the social activities. And so I would say, don't just be like, I've got to check these boxes to graduate so I can go be a nurse or an engineer or business or a teacher or whatever. Instead, really focus on the moment and the things you're getting a chance to learn and the opportunities that so many people in the world never even have. That, yeah. that we're, even as far as education goes, we're fairly ahead in the opportunities people have to go to college here in this country. And so I think focusing on, and even if you don't like it, appreciating what it is that this is teaching you about yourself is a really important tool. Yeah, being aware that it's you that it's growing, not just your knowledge base. Students who come in and they bore in so specifically on getting that engineering degree, they don't pay attention to anything else. Okay, so they get that degree and then they get to be an engineer. And by the time they're 40, guess what? They're really good at one thing, and they're bored because they haven't learned somewhere along the line about Frankenstein or about the French Revolution or astronomy or something that might, you know, refresh their heart and their mind as well. They're like that lumberjack who's been hacking away and he never sharpened his axe. The other thing is, and I don't know if this is a considered a politically incorrect thing word to use anymore or not, but there's this thing called cultural capital. And what that is, if I understand it, is something about the culture that spawned the professions and the daily life that you're living in so that you are able to perform in whatever, whether it be your daily life, your professional life, your life among friends, with a sense of the community, the world that you grew out of. 
We were talking in class today about how in this novel, North and South, which is about the Industrial Revolution in England, and how they were suddenly going through a period of financial downfall because the industrial complex had developed to a point that they didn't know how to handle it yet. And there were people losing money and there was big financial distress. Guess what? What's happening in the global economy right now today? There's this global development and nobody quite knows how to handle it. And you see some of the same kind of reaction of people panicking, blaming, all those different things. Same story, different chapter. And knowing that is helpful. I have political science friends. When I talk with Dr. Bryant about political situations right now, and he reminds me it's been as crazy in the 1920s and in the 1840s. And just knowing that stuff can help you not panic, not worry, be calm, and keep on traveling forward. Yeah, I tell my students regularly that it's a misconception that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Because the past doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. It rhymes. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a bar. I, I yeah. like Yeah, that's yeah. so good. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I've got a couple don'ts. Sure. First of all, don't miss class if you can help it. Even if you haven't done the homework, show up. You'll get something out of class. Second of all, if you do miss class, don't come up to the professor and say, did I miss anything? Of course you missed something. It was my class. <laughs> the things that I thought were so important. I always joke with my students like, no, we were all so sad at your presence. We just sat here in silence for 55 minutes wishing you were here. <laughs> of course we did stuff. Find out from your friends. <laughs> things like that, yeah. yeah. So what, do you have any do's and don'ts? I've, I'm embarrassed. I didn't write any do's or don'ts. I, if I were to just go off the top of my head, it would be, and this is why we're doing that whole episode coming up about what does your tuition actually include, would be do use every resource you pay for. Or at least here at UT Tyler, you pay for free mental health services. You pay for access to the writing center, access to the library. They give away free stuff all the time in the UC. You pay for that. That comes from what you pay for. The gym, like we were talking earlier about part of taking care of yourself is eating right, getting your sleep, and exercise is like those are the big three. And here on campus, you have, especially four-year universities, free access to a Really nice gym. Take advantage of that. So I think from the stuff that didn't get said, that would probably be my big do. My big don't, I would say reiterate, don't be afraid of your professors. I don't think that students realize how much professors are just people who are at their day job. And especially the professors who have been here 10 plus years. If you're a new student, your professors know where's good to eat. They know what's going on in the community. Don't just ask them, hey, when is this assignment due? Like, where's the best tacos? If you're looking to get a job, go ask your professors. If you're looking to get plugged into any kind of community group, I guarantee your professors know what clubs are going on and what groups, especially if it's, for example, if you're interested in English, you like that subject, ask your English professor, are there any English clubs, writing groups, book clubs, any of that kind of stuff, they're going to know. So that would probably be my big don't is don't be afraid of your professors, um, not only in, a, in an educational standpoint, but like just as a human being. I'll tell you something that drives me crazy that students do is they'll come into class and they don't have their book and they don't have their notebook and they don't have a pencil or a pen. Yeah. And I want my students to come in, sit down, get out their book, get out their notes and be ready to go. Yeah. And I think that any professional job will expect you to show up and be ready to roll, not just sitting there with your arms folded across your chest waiting for somebody to tell you what to do. Tell you to do something. So show up and, be, and show that you're ready to roll is an important one. And that's a professional skill as well as an academic skill. The other thing is have a calendar of some sort. Oh, yeah. Scheduling. A schedule book, a calendar. If you're, Some people use their phones, but use it. Keep track of it. The last thing is not only take notes. But here's the trick. Review them. If you just take them, you're not going to always even remember what you said. But if you review them and you can fill them in, yeah, that's a really important thing. I think I actually do have one more do and don't. So my one more do is do take advantage of all the new resources that are out there. The software, we have a lot of design classes. Take advantage of Canva. Take advantage of all these new programs and softwares that make your workflow smoother and your quality of life better. There's a ton of stuff out there that makes being a college student easier. Do take advantage of that. 
um, and do hunt those down. My don't is don't try to show up a minute before the class starts. So first of all, you can't get your stuff set out and everything like that. The problem we have right now is with parking. And if you plan to have a three minute window, you might not find a parking spot in time. But the main reason to me, and of course, to y'all, it's probably because it's disruptive. But to me, the main reason you want to show up or I try to show up a couple minutes early is that's where you start making your friends, especially when you're a new student, whether you're a freshman or you're a transfer. It's those couple minutes before class that you know, a lot of times it'll just start, hey, did you do this assignment already? And they're like, no. And you're like, me neither. And <laughs> that's where the camaraderie starts. And a lot of times, like nine times out of 10, that's where I've made my friends. That's how it started with my friends on campuses those little five, seven minutes right before class. You got nothing else to do, so you, you start small talk and it goes from there. So whenever I was taking a mass comm class here, I would show up a few minutes early for class and that showing up, and the teacher would show up a little bit early. We started to talk. And with all of the stuff that I was doing in class, that sparked her to actually, that's how I got my job was getting to class a little bit earlier and talking. A lot of good things can come from going to class earlier. Yeah, that's how I got plugged into the Talon was... Noah was a lab tech for one of my classes, and I would be in there, and I got to know him, and then another professor, I guess our supervisor of the talent, mentioned it. So when I went to the first meeting, I saw a familiar face there, and that's how I got plugged in to all of that. So it, absolutely. Also, you're not late, and the professor likes you more. And then, as we were saying, as the student who, if something comes up in your life later in the semester— Professors are probably not as happy to help the student who's late to every single class. <laughs> and yeah, y'all are nodding y'all's heads. You have not earned the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're so grateful to both of you for taking some time to talk to us about this. I'm sure that after we all leave, we'll have about five more things we think of that we wanted to say. And so if those things come to mind, save them and we'll get you to come back. Sounds great. Thanks, Alex, for having us. Yeah, it's been a blessing. Thank you. Great. This has been the Ask Dr. Ross podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you have any questions that you want Dr. Ross to answer, you can email us at adrquestions at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.